Well, welcome everyone to podcast number 42 of the danjohnuniversity.com podcast. Just as a note, uh, while I'm working here, uh, our city workers accidentally cut a gas line. So if you see a massive explosion, uh, I'm just letting you know I'm here to help. I hope. We have a question from Patrick. Patrick asks this, what are your thoughts on end range strength and using resistance to gain mobility. I think there's great value in it, especially at end ranges of motion and what may be seen as extreme end ranges of motion. Uh, that is under load, moving through a non-advantage range of motion on a joint, Jefferson curls for gaining the bike pike position, German hang skin the cat for shoulder extension, seated good mornings to gain pancake position, position to name a few. Well, I was fine until you started <laughs> listing the exercises. You know, if you're a gymnast or you're in a sport that demands extreme flexibility, this is a good tool to have in your toolkit. But boy, are you talking about, Patrick, a cost of benefit issue. Uh, interesting though, as a child, we used to do skin the cats all the time. And I actually thought, and in hindsight, I still think this, that's a pretty good exercise. There's, that's a that's a valuable thing to do. Um, I just don't like the seated good morning. Um, I think it's my time teaching uh, adolescence where if something can go wrong, it will, you know, kind of the weightlifting rooms, Murphy's law. But yeah, so Patrick, if you have an endeavor where you need it, do it. Um, I know sometimes people like to do these bizarre mobility tricks, you know, the hold my beer and watch this stuff. I'm not sure you'd want to do that uh, for most people, but if it's how you make your living, you know, if you're a contortionist or you're a gymnast or you're in a thing where you need that, boy, if you have to do it, do it. But other than that, uh, I would err on less in that area. Thank you for your question, Patrick. I think I know where Tony's from, just by the way he asked the question. What would be your training recommendations for police constables using kettlebell-based programming? Well, my suggestions would be to first break it up into uh, what's needed. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the basic three movements, the kettlebell swing, if taught appropriately and done well, the goblet squat, and the basic Turkish getup with reasonable load. Uh, those three exercises by themselves can do some nice things. Uh, the ballistic hinge movement, which can be done through the uh, with the Olympic lifting bar and the snatch and the clean and jerk. Um, I was told years ago, you never want to get into a fight with a shot putter or an Olympic lifter, because if they do decide to snap, you're going to stay snapped. So the swing would have great value for punching and kicking. The goblet squat for mobility, and that's a huge issue, especially for police officers who spend all day in the car. And the Turkish getup would be good for all all body mobility and probably flexibility too. So I would say get those basic three in there. Uh, they would make a good complement with basic exercises. I would probably recommend with police officers being able to do a lot of, oh, let's go through the whole list. So in the push family, I'm sure when you guys train, you do a lot of push-ups, I think press-ups where you're from, uh, which would make me want you to do more overhead work. Uh, the pull-up is a good thing for your job, get you over a fence, uh, I have a cousin who's a famous American SWAT team guy, and I, many of his stories involve him sprinting and you know pulling himself over a fence in all of his gear and a really really long rifle. Um, there's great value in the pull up. The mobility work of the goblet squat would be probably good for you. The explosive dynamic hinge would be good for you. A swing swing family, and of course a Turkish get up practicing getting up and down off the ground. And I would also include rucking like a, uh, like a military application there. Where you can go from there, of course, is get stronger and stronger and stronger. But uh, I would be very reasonable about what your standards were. If you have a standard for a police officer, say it's 15 pull-ups. Um, if you start putting on so much mass, you can't do 15 pull-ups anymore. I think that that might be a bad decision because... If you have to get over a wall or a fence for your safety, it's much better to be able to scramble up that fence or wall than to look real good in front of it. Uh, I hope that helped, Janie. Uh, that's a very good question.
We have a question from Danny. I had a septic elbow at age of one. That's a rough one. Which damaged my elbow joint. They say I have arthritis now. It did not begin truly limiting me until age 30. I'm 35 now. I lost about 15 degrees of both flexion and extension. That's a lot. Doing heavier extension, uh, specifically pushes or flexion movements, can cause the joint to flare up for weeks. The doc said to avoid doing that, and I agree. Uh, that's the old joke from when I, the vaudeville joke. Does it hurt when you do this? Yes. Well, don't do that. Um, what would you recommend for someone with an arthritic elbow who wants to be able to lift and move heavy things? I only began lifting a year ago, and I'm able to do the following just fine. Back squats, deadlift, farmer carries, and most movements where my elbow is locked. Uh, boy, you had me at hello with those three. Um, I'm happy to see you can deadlift. That's that's very good. Uh, maybe what you want to think of, um, let's put farmer walks over here. Think about what Phil Maffetone recommends for training. Do a set of maybe five in the back squat. Rest three minutes. Do a set of five in the deadlift. Rest three minutes. Squat, rest, deadlift, rest, squat. I mean, I've looked at those workouts. He does about four to six cycles of that. And when you add up, I mean, it's going to be it's going to be a good solid workout and then finish with farmer walks. If you can ruck or you can do uh, any variation of hugging, that might be just a great combination. Now, now someone's going to raise their hand and say, well, you're not doing any upper body work. Well, I would argue very quickly, the body is one piece. You know, if you deadlift over 500 kilos, uh, you're going to have a pretty stout upper body. I, I can guarantee you that. Um, the nice thing about the back squat, and I've only really begun to understand this recently, is that there is no burden put on the grip or the forearms. And I think that's why so many mass building programs include the back squat, because you're able to do, you're not constrained by grip. So it's nice here with the back squat and the deadlift is that your grip is going to be getting plenty of rest in between the squats. But the, the big engines, the, the hips, the back, all those, the, the thighs, all those big engines on your body are going to really be working out hard. Danny, I, I, can't, I can't give you any medical advice on this elbow issue, but I think the fact that you've discovered those three exercises puts you far ahead of most people I talk to right now. Try that a little idea a couple times and get back to me. Oh, and I would suggest doing uh, the farmer walk or whatever thing you can do as at the end of that, as a finisher. You do not want to mess with your grip while doing deadlifts. If you do that two or three times a week, uh, I think some good things are going to happen. Danny, good luck to you, and thanks for your question. Vincente asks a good question, and it's going to be a hard one to answer, and, and you'll see why. In the book, Easy Strength, you talk about the what the heck effect. It's also called the, the WTF effect. Are there other movements besides a swing that this applies to? Well, folks, the what the heck effect is this bizarre thing that happens sometimes. And it's great when you see it in something like track and field because it is measurable. And it would be true in swimming where you're doing this. You add this thing that doesn't make any sense at all, but you get so much more out of your training. Uh, I found that true a, a, a rather too late in my career when I learned how to correctly do the swing. But for me, the big one was loaded carries. When I began doing loaded carries, uh, the, the amount of work I put in seemed to transfer massively across my athletics at the time. Uh, this is my, I didn't plan this, but this is my 2003-2004 journal. Probably the best season I've ever had. And uh, when, I, when I go into it, it's just... <laughs> It's interesting because it's all what the heck effects. I discovered that year that doing hang snatches, Olympic bar hang snatches, but focusing on the Romanian deadlift. So slowly go sliding down the thighs, slide past the knee, slide one inch uh, below the knee, and then snatch had a huge impact. Uh, I write down sleds. I write down, oh, uh, yeah, this one's a little different. I'll come back to this one. Uh, running with rocks, that's something I used to do. I'd pick up rocks and run with them. Uh, farmer walks, which I just mentioned with loaded carries. This other one we, is called Armstrong Swings, named after Jeff Armstrong. Uh, it is when you pick up a, a Scottish hammer and you swing it on one side. 
and you do, let's just say you do 10 and then you rest and then you swing it on the other side and you try to build up to one minute of swinging. Now, folks, that doesn't sound like much, but when you're done, every throwing muscle in your body not only got worked, but the mobility jump was there. So it was funny to read that out to you because that's real, oh, uh, real quick point. At the end of every journal, I always summarize, I always summarize uh, the things in the area of diet that worked. That's back when we first were experimenting with Lyle McDonald's uh, diet, cyclical ketogenic dieting, which was called anabolic dieting in some of the magazines. Uh, eat, <laughs> eat meat, fish. <laughs> Um, uh, fish oil. This is when I started really getting into fish oil. Oh, and number six, carbs, carbohydrates make me fat. And then this was my plan for the next series of workouts. That's the best way to do a journal that I know. Uh, oh, and when I go into them, I always try to type up what I learned from the last one and see if that carries over. It doesn't always. So that's kind of fun. Uh, so yeah, loaded carries, absolute mind blower for me. Swings, um, focusing on ballistic work that wasn't near uh, on maxes. And this one I talk about doing, oh, I must have done that, that RDO snatch thing I did. I would do those sets of three with ridiculously light weights. And you could see it when I was out in the ring throwing. And then the Armstrong drill, the Scottish hammer swings, uh, I couldn't figure out why all of a sudden in the discus, my finish was just so stable. And then and later I looked and it was the Armstrong swings. Vincente, you need to do your own little things there too. But you might find in your life, for example, a friend of mine uh, became a pescatarian. Uh, the only protein he eats that's, is, is fish. Completely changed his life. So uh, to me, that's a what the heck effect. On paper, it doesn't fit. But when you step back and look at this work. So I would suggest looking in the... I would look into a couple areas of your life for this. Uh, so nutrition, uh, recovery, uh, basic, you know, gym-based training, and then the other stuff training, and try to see, find the things that in your life seem to have a bigger impact than they should. So that's what the what the heck effect is. You do something and, uh, wow, that was, that was interesting. All right, thanks for your question. Okay, Matthias asked this question. I am curious of your thoughts on obstacle course racing and training for these events. I'm getting more and more into it in the half marathon distances with about 50 various challenges scattered into it. Well, you know, uh, growing up, that was a standard part of what we did normally. I don't know if this will translate, but we have a thing here in the United States called junior high. Basically, it would be uh, well, probably about 12 to 14 years of age. It's, a, it's one of the stops in the school system. My junior high, part of our daily warm-up, we would run about 600 to 800 meters, and then we had this full obstacle course in it. And I still think that's some of the smartest training I ever did in my life. I mentioned that it's called Southwood Junior High. I mention a lot in my, in my writings. Uh, I like obstacle course work. Uh, here in the United States, and I'm sure there are other places, but some of the uh, parks will have something called a par course. Uh, yeah, it's based on the same term as parkour, um, my junior college Skyline was one of the first to have one in the United States. And they, they basically in the beginning were much more obstacle -y. Now they're more general calisthenics. You know, you do step ups and sit ups, but one, the first ones, they were a lot of, um, they would be monkey bars this way. There was monkey bars with parallel bars. There was a, a, a dip walk. Uh, you, you had to jump over things. I, I'm a big fan of it. Now into training on it, um, I would prefer that you talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. If you can find Coach Joe D, D I, uh, he's he's a, a, a guy I've worked with a couple times. He was one of the first real programmers for the Spartan races. Uh, I would rather you listen to somebody like that than some, you know, somebody like me who really doesn't know, hasn't done it. Um, I I like the fact that all kinds of people enjoy and and, and do them. Uh, I think they have great value. The only thing I hope, just don't get yourself hurt doing something too stupid, all right? My best to you. Thank you. We have a question from Shimon. Shimon. 
What do you think about learning Olympic lifts at age 35? I think it's a great idea if you don't know how. Right now, I'm training a 42-year-old how to do them. Uh, we're meeting three to four times a week, and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Is it too late, or, is it, or it still may bring some value? Um, also, are your programs with Olympic lifts designed for everyone else or elite athletes over? Well, the answer is yes. There's, there's, you got to separate that out. So when I train an older adult, there's two things we need to work on first. Uh, and really, it uh, it is what the Olympic lifts are, hinge, squat, hinge, squat, okay? And so you, you, you have to have both uh, carried down. So when I work with an older person, no offense, uh, Shimon, you're older. Uh, the first thing we do is we do a goblet squat where you take the belt, you drop, you drop down, you push your knees apart, curl the weight to the ground, pick up a broomstick, stand up with it like an overhead squat, sit back down, broomstick to the ground, curl the weight up, push your knees out, stand up, and we have you do that, I don't know, three to five reps. It seems like that's about the right amount. So that's to, to teach the overhead squat position and where the lower back needs to be. The other thing we do, and there's a video on my Instagram of Jeff Hemingway doing it, uh, if you know how to do kettlebell swings, we do a set of kettlebell swings, put the weight on the back, and we we then, okay, so called a Romanian deadlift stretch. You're holding the weight like this behind your back, and you push your butt into it to really stretch the hamstrings. You push your chin, and I want you to feel like you're being torn in half by the chin and the butt. And then after that, we just get in the same position with a broomstick to show where that's going to be when you Olympic lift. So those are the foundational exercises. By the way, I teach the snatch first to adults because many adults don't have the wrist flexibility to clean yet. They can, they, they don't have the body flexibility to snatch, but I've discovered, and this could be my own, I could be wrong, but teaching a snatch to an adult uh, seems a little easier than teaching a clean. It's easier to get the whole body more mobile, more mobile than this darn rack position in the clean. Um, and then what we do after that, we do our first complex, and the complex is very simple. You do like eight Romanian deadlifts, snatch grip Romanian deadlifts to groove that position, eight hang snatches, eight overhead squats, and then bring the bar down for eight back squats. And uh, really like, I mean, we're talking the naked bar or just a broomstick for a while. And I've called it in the past the rule of exhaustion. And it seems weird to say this, but sometimes with an adult, you have to get them tired before they'll go oh, and just let it go. So when they do those overhead squats after the RDLs and after those snatches, they finally just start to just let the weight guide them down and then just stand back up. They, they quit fighting against it. Uh, if you ever have to teach someone like the hammer throw or the discus throw, doing a hundred turns in a row or a hundred swings with the hammer, the person gets so tired that finally they let it go. And instead of being like this the whole time, they, they, just let, they just let the wire take them, which of course is what we want. Also, are your programs with Olympic lifts designed for everybody else, everyone else, or elite athletes only? Uh, if you go to the danjohnuniversity.com, I'm sure I have it, it's on the Q&A. Uh, I have uh, an easy strength program uh, for everybody. Um, basically, it's you, you go to bed, you fast, you get up in the morning, uh, and you do a complex, like three sets of eight in uh, one of our Olympic lifting complexes. Then you eat, and then later in the day, you do like, it's not very much. It's, you know, five sets of two in the snatch, uh, three singles in a clean and jerk, and a farmer walk. And it's very simple. It's daily. It's for, a, a, that'd be for somebody who wants to learn the Olympic lifts, isn't going to be an Olympian, uh, wants to compete maybe. Uh, but if I'm going to train elite athletes, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find a really good coach to send that person to. Um, when I train track and field, I feel very confident about it, or football. I feel very confident about my skill set in teaching the Olympic lifts, but there are much better coaches than me in the old lifts. Question number two. My second question relates to Mass Made Simple. Before the pandemic, I started Mass Made Simple and completed week four. And then the gym got close. Ooh, that's a tough one. If I decide to go back to the program, should I start it all over again? Or will it be safe to skip the first few weeks and start in week three or four? 
You know, uh, interesting. Uh, uh, these are questions I don't think anyone's ever had before because no one's ever had this uh, shut in place, locked down in place before. You know, logically, if you feel like you are making progress, uh, it's up to you. I mean, my first instinct would be to go back to day one and redo the whole thing. But if you drop back, let's see, if you said you're on week four. So you're you're around, uh, you know, you're in the workout six, seven, eight range, right? If you backed off one week, maybe, uh, you know, went backwards one week, don't pick up on week five, but pick up on the first part of week four. That might be it and just kind of ease your way back into it. Um, the reason I like the first couple of workouts is those high rep, low weight squat workouts where you just get used to the bar. Uh, I tell people this, it, 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 you probably need kilos, but uh, you know, if you're doing back squats with 40 kilos, it's not very heavy, but getting used to doing 30 reps and you're, you get that weird, the grip issues and it feels like everything's falling asleep up here and it kind of grinds on your neck a little bit. That does take a little bit of use, uh, getting used to. So maybe, and I'm just spitballing here because I don't know. This is, this is a new situation. Maybe go back and do workout, the very first workout, the very second workout, and then pick back up on where you left off. But you, I want you to make sure you have at least some kind of break in or transition. So two options, go back, you know, the week before is where I started up again on three or four, or go back to one and two and then pick up. But I really want you to have some kind of break in period before you get going. And finally, Question number three. Finally, do you approve kettlebell snatches instead of swings as power exercises on easy strength? Uh, people tried it. The one problem with the snatch versus the swing is the snatch has such a longer stroke. And so the swing stops here and the snatch continues here. And you go, okay, so what? It's bringing that ballistic down. So it's that long stroke down. Uh, that eccentric movement as it, you know, shoots down into your hips. That can be the issue. Uh, people have tried it. Um, no one's ever really made it work. And when I look at the numbers, I still think the numbers are too high. Uh, originally, uh, Luke and I were experimenting with 100 left and 100 right a day. Well, that's way too many. And then we st thought about just 50-50. And I'm starting to think that's too many. It would have to be more like 25, 25, or even 20, 20. So that's the issue. You've got to, you've got to respect the extra stroke that as, as you come down. All that, all that speed on the ball, all that uh, the the buildup of the ballistic load is the problem. Uh, err on the side of less on that if you're going to try it. Um, and if you can do it for all 40 days, uh, I think you'll find some good things happening. Uh, just don't burn up doing it too soon. Thank you for these questions. They're very good. We have a question from Joe. I have been currently running the Big 21 as an introduction to Olympic lifting. Uh, I learned that's yeah, not that's not what it's it's not an introduction program. I learned that the program is intended for experienced Olympic lifters after I'd already done three workouts. I am currently at the fifth workout and my clean and press has been shooting up. I have a problem though. The power snatch, while not particularly heavy, has a great metabolic hit. Yep. And by the time I reach a clean and jerk, I'm gassed. Do you have any experience with changing the exercise order each workout? Oh, I mean, like you do the clean and press last. Oh, yeah. You, it's, we have already have a few uh, strikes as we go through this. Joe, it's for experienced lifters. It's for a three-week boost to get them ready for a track season or maybe prepare them uh, for an Olympic lifting meet coming up way after that. But yeah, I think you could do that. Do you have any experience changing the exercise order? Also, I s seem to be only to able to get two good jerks each workout, the two heavy heaviest ones. Any idea on what's going on? Yeah, um, stop jerking. Uh, I always tell people, you jerk with your ears. So as you dip, what I want you to think about is making as much noise with your front foot as you can. Dip, stomp, dip. Stomp. That's how you jerk heavy weights overhead. Uh, every so often online, I'll read that uh, you know my coaching points aren't aren't good enough. But uh, you know, bigger, faster, stronger has a video of me jerking 385 for five in kilos, 175 for five. 
I mean, you got to give me a little break here. I must know something to be able to handle those kinds of loads. But dip, slap, make as much noise. I'm assuming you're jerking, split jerking. But if you're doing the other style, the push jerk, try to have both feet make a noise. Slap on the ground. Dip, slap. Dip, stomp. Dip, slap. That might help a lot. And I'd like you to get back with me on that clue to see if that helps you, Joe. Okay? Thank you. We have a question from Andrew. I know a couple of Andrews. I am interested in your thoughts regarding implementing easy strength principles for Highland Games. Do you believe that these principles can be applied to the throwing portion of training in addition to the weight room work? Uh, one of my favorite books on Highland Gaming is Mike and Mindy Pakowski's uh, A Contrarian Approach to the Highland Games. I'd recommend you read what they talk about first. Um, the mistake most young Highland gamers make, Andrew, is they think they're going to get it done in the weight room. Um, during my best season, oddly, it's it's right here again. This is the 2003-2004 the year. Um, what I began to do, and it's not a terrible thing. I mean, can we get two pieces of advice? Um, if you're talking about what we call range throwing, that's when you pick a target... Uh, well, in the discus, we use a garbage can, but in the Highland Games, that garbage can wouldn't last long. You find a, you put a target out there that's about 80% of your best throw, and you try to see how easy you can drop it into the hula hoop or the bucket or the circle you painted on the ground or, or whatever. And it's called range throwing, uh, or it's called target practice in some places. And what you try to do is over time, move that target out a little farther. Because remember, we're not trying to pull our max up. We're trying to prod from the bottom of our max up. So yes, you could just do that very simply by itself. Um, that's actually a very good thing. I think you'd find it works really, really well with the Braemar, the heavy hammer, and the heavy weight for distance. Because what's going to happen is once you start to move your feet, uh, in the, I'm thinking the heavy weight, once you start to just move your feet and hold the position, you'll be surprised how much distance you get just by, you know, kind of staying in the center of the storm instead of trying to, you know, do all this stuff to it. With the heavy hammer, you're going to find yourself wind, 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 release. Well, that goes really far. And you say, well, why, don't, why am I working so hard to throw, you know, one foot farther or 20 feet farther, whatever. Um, one other thing I'd like to, you to think about is picking a day. Now, I used to do this. Uh, I only did it with the Braemar, the heavy hammer, the heavyweight, farmer walk. Oh, there had to, there was five. I can't remember uh, some and a fifth of that. And you go out there and you try to practice what it feels like to compete in a Highland game. Uh, give yourself about two plus hours to do this, where you get in there, you warm up. If you have to warm up for every event, you throw. You make don't but don't try to make lifetime best. Try to get those I. Three, I need this mark throws. So in range throwing, you're about 80%. Um, with, uh, with this day, this drill, say like you throw 40 feet for the heavy weight for distance, uh, generally need a 36 or 38 to, to be where you need to be. You would put something out there at, at that length. And how much, how much do you have to light up to make those throws? I don't want you throwing the 40, 41. What, does, what do you need to be, where do you need to be up here to throw that 36, 37 foot throw? And just try that. I found that really helped. I, was a tr I also did the track and field weight pentathlon. And one of the things I would do is I would change the implements, uh, uh, Andrew. So like one day I went and instead of you throwing the standard two kilo discus, I did this uh, in the weight pentathlon with the women's discus. Instead of throwing the hammer hammer, I threw a chain hammer. I threw a 56 pound weight, a Highland game weight, instead of the 35. But what I was trying to do was practice that weird tired that you have that uh, in a Highland games competition. Um, I've competed in what, seven events in a day, nine events in some of the places. Um, Jeff loosely a few times had these days where I swear we did 13, 14 events. Uh, I remember one time it was, it was the battle of the hammers where we had to throw every single hammer. Um, for distance, three three sets. That was a long day. Um, that weird tired that you get at the end of a Highland game has to be practiced. So, in regards to easy strength principles, yes, 
and track and field athletes have been doing it for generations. Uh, the hard thing for you to get used to is the idea that not every throw is going to be your lifetime best. So you need to practice that. So what we're doing is we're practicing the intensities we need for superior uh, performance. I hope that helps. Scott writes, I just finished reading 40 Years with a Whistle. Oh, good. One person read it last week and found it very enjoyable with numerous life lessons gleaned from your experience. One of the phrases I have heard you mention in several podcasts, as well as in the book, is the importance of choosing wisely. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, uh, the knight at the end. As you describe your career, you appear to have had a lot of good choices in both your work and family life. True. I've had a history of not making the best decision, which generally leads to anger and regret. When it comes time to decide whether to host a workshop, do an interview, invest in a venture, write a book or go on a family vacation, can you please share your decision-making process? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we have a family motto, uh, three words, uh, make a difference. So when it comes to anything in the realm of, is this gonna make the world a better place? I always say yes. Is this gonna help uh, weightlifting in Sweden? Is this gonna help the, the fine people in Galway be better personal trainers? Yes, yes, then we always say yes. The other thing about when it comes to vacations, uh, we say yes to the adventure. Uh, I was doing a workshop, I don't even remember. I, it must have been Dublin. And one of the young men at the thing came up and he said uh, that his mom has a, has a little place in Sligo where we like to visit. And Tiff and I turned to each other and said, yes, because you say yes to the adventure. So I got a chance to meet Niall. Uh, a year or so later, I went to his wedding. Uh, we remained very good friends. He visited me here in uh, Utah. Uh, uh, try to say yes to the adventure uh, as much as you can. Um, so make a difference. That's the that's the first one, okay? Uh, will this make the world a better place? I mean, I know it sounds silly, but I mean, that's, that's how I think. Number two, say yes to the adventure. You know, I'm not going <laughs> to... I love Murray, Utah, but I'm, I'm not going to have a ton of you know, hair raising experiences hit over here in East Murray. Um, and, and really, I want to say there's a third, but it's going to be hard for me to kind of be so clear on. Um, when I was young and I first started writing in journals, I would occasionally write to my future self, which is a strange thing to do. But, um, now I'm kind of my future self. I'm that guy. That sounds weird. And so I kind of think sometimes, what would 14-year-old Danny John want? What 13-year-old? Would Danny John want to go to Ireland? Yes, yes, he would. Would he want to go to Okinawa? Yes, yes, he would. Would he like to fly first class to Hawaii? Yeah, yeah, he would. And so one of the things I, I kind of go back and I think about, uh, is this, in, in, the guy sitting here, I always tell people, you're the sum of your habits to this moment. Well, you're the sum of your decisions. Um, how happy would those other Danny Johns be uh, as we go through? Scott, I know that's vague, but boy, those things work for me. Okay? Does it make a difference? Say yes to the adventure. In, and would it impress your 14-year-old self? Uh, sounds crazy, but it works. Thank you. Johan writes, can you please elaborate on your standards of 15 times body weight on squats and bench press? And then he says, everybody else on the web are talking about 1.5 body weight squat for one rep and 1.2 or whatever bench press for one rep as strong. Um, why the same rep scheme on the same weight for two such different movements? Um, I also have that for the overhead squat. Uh, the reason is just, yeah, Johan, um, and, and I know it sounds weird, but if you can overhead squat your body weight, you got to understand this point. This is the whole point. If you can bench your body weight 15 times, if you can overhead squat your body weight 15 times or back squat it 15 times, your problem is not the weight room. Your problem is what you're doing on the field of play. This is for athletes, though, by the way. Remember that. And so what happens is, is that when you're working with athletes, they're always chasing numbers. And I did all the time. You know, I wanted that. And I wanted the 400 clean. My goal was the 400. So 400 clean, 400 front squat, 400 bench. And yeah, I, I got there. I didn't need it. I was, 
you know, we had a we had a semi engine on a on a Volkswagen. We had a truck engine on a Volkswagen. You know, an old Volkswagen bug. I my engine was too big. My wheels couldn't stay in the ground. Um, one of the things you have to learn to do when you're working with elite athletes, and by the way, those numbers come from my friend Will Heffernan too. Uh, I just stole them from him, and I think I used to give him credit, but you know, I still make sure I do. Uh, the idea, and those of us who've been around a while, there's this line in the sand where you're strong enough. The reason you're not starting, the reason you're not on the national team, isn't the weight room. It's you. There's skills you don't have. And you're, you've got to work on those skills. Um, because of what I do, I get a chance to be on the field with American professional football teams and American professional baseball teams. When I'm in Ireland, being on the field with Connick Rugby. You know, when you're out there, you can certainly see that the guys are weight room strong. There's no question they're weight room strong. But then when you look at the skills that they have that got them there, then you go, oh, I see. It's not just they can bench this or squat that they actually perform all that out there in the field of play. So that's why I use those numbers. By the way, and those numbers literally, it's because it comes from the number of pull-ups most of us think you should be able to do. Most of us think about 15 pull-ups is about where you need to be. So if 15 pull-ups is a good number, just toss them in there for the bench press and, and the squat. Uh, I'm telling you, if you test yourself on those lifts with your body weight for reps, very often, you get a really good chance. You can scale it right across. You do the bench press body weight, you do your pull up, you do your back squat, you do your overhead squat, and then do the farmer walk tests. Uh, and then of course, you know, the deadlift is, sits over here by itself. Uh, when you've done that day, and you know, you know, say like you can do, you know, five benches with your body weight, but you can back squat it for 35, very common in Europe. Uh, I would say you need more pushing. No American in the world would ever have that problem. But the Americans won't be able to squat their back squat for 15, and so or overhead squat it. And so what it does, it allows you as a coach to find, to show, well, you don't have to show it. It's, it's right there. It's just, it leaps out to everybody. I hope that helps. And again, if you don't, if you disagree with my numbers, that there's no problem with that. Just be sure you find your own, and then you'll be answering the same question in a while. Because it's the journey of finding standards that's the most difficult, I think. We have a question from Ron. I am 64 at a healthy weight and I've been quite active. I'm trying to figure out what to do to be able to keep good enough for my longevity. Good health defined as brain functioning and dementia at bay, good idea. Strong enough to catch, carry, keep the grandchildren, good. Avoid chronic illness, including high blood pressure, diabetes, chronic pain, especially low back, should I be doing any bus bench to accomplish my goals or should I just stick with the park bench? Love the workouts from the generator. So I expect your answer to be non-binary and sort of it depends, but look forward to your thoughts. Ron, this is one of the few times I'm ever going to give you a, a it not, it depends. Park bench, park bench, park bench, park bench. Uh, where you're at at 64, your joint mobility and your lean body mass are the two things I want to focus on. Uh, and you'll notice with all your goals, uh, having appropriate lean body mass numbers and healthy joints are going to help you with every one of those. Um, so yeah, I would stick with the park bench. I would use any mental energy you have after a park bench workout to chop vegetables and make a good meal. Uh, drink more water. Use all that other, ooh, I should be doing more work in the weight room. Use that to, you know, uh, make better vegetable choices, make better protein choices, drink more water. So for one of the few times in my career, there, this is not a it depends answer. Matthew asks a question. My question involves women and lifting weights. A couple of the female clients I train have a real fear of weights. Yeah, that's it's getting better, huh? Uh, I relay the benefits and how women are very unlikely to bulk up by getting them strong due to hormonal differences, etc. However, I've had the retort in regards to CrossFit and women bodybuilders. Well, yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, but I then explained the volume and intensity that would be far greater than I would use with the general population client. I wanted to get your two cents on the best ways to overcome this objection. Oh, I tell you, Matthew, I can't believe this keeps coming up. Uh, for one, um, 
there's a chance if you ever go to a women's bodybuilding competition that the, the, the athletes are enhanced in several different ways. Um, I don't want to be too rude, but it's certainly, uh, they've been manipulated in several different fashions. It's very difficult to, to look the way they look. And on, and on the CrossFit, from what I understand, they probably do some things too. I, I can't answer that question anymore. I've tried, and uh, Matthew, I just feel like this is one of those questions where I feel like I hit my head against the wall. Um, to me, it's, to me, it sounds like this. Uh, if Matthew you threw me a basketball and I said, "Oh no, no, I don't want to be taller," well, you, you, wait, what? Yeah, I don't want to be that tall. I don't want. If I play basketball, I'm gonna end up, you know, seven foot and playing in the NBA. To me, it's the same thing here. Um, the pushback against weights is more than this thing they say. It's more than that. And I've never been able to get my hand on it. Uh, I do know this. Once women start weightlifting, they make the best progress of anybody. And the, 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 the amount of... In, it's, it's glorious, the, the effects they have. But, you know, I'm going to go slam my face against the wall a few more times and, and try to come up with a better answer. But I have been, had the pushback from that my entire career. When I started in 1979, um, some of the first women I worked with, um, they were, well, for one thing, very brave because it was a different world then. But they would get that thing. My mom says that if I lift weights and then fill in the blank of some kind of insanity. Um, let's just do our best, Matthew, to keep teaching and, and um, just keep going on this. Uh, we're making we're making progress. It's just kind of like uh, slow progress. I wish I had more to say. Thank you. Eh, question from Dan. A lot of Dans today. Do you have any recommendation on how to implement some of the pirate maps and shark habits with a family that has resistance? Uh, <laughs> so you you know my daughter Lindsay D. Uh, I really like the idea of weekly meal schedules, laundry days, etc. But I'm having uh, trouble getting my family on board and then the next question is what kind of polo shirts do you wear uh i don't know but it's that ancient bird uh it was the it's the dinosaur bird guy so like ostratelix or something like that i don't know but if you want to buy me excel um yeah uh we had a lot of pushback with Lindsay on it uh constantly uh she hated I hate steak. We'll come up with, just ask everybody else in the family. There's four of us. So ask your other. And just whatever you pick is fine. Uh, that's how I stop most of it. Um, if you've seen our pirate map uh, or our chores list, um, one of the nice things about having a chore list is with Monday being white laundry, uh, you'll find after a while, everybody gets it. So you have two baskets in a room, white and dark. And you never bug them for white laundry until Monday. Monday's white laundry day, and Tuesday's dark laundry, and Wednesday you clean the bathrooms, and whatever whatever's appropriate. Uh, yeah, you get pushback from it uh, uh, constantly. And then here's the weirdest thing, Dan. When your kids are adults, they do every single thing you taught them. It is having a menu, having a chore list, Having a, a daily thing, everyone, the, the kids, we, uh, we called it walk around. It was called walk around. You have to walk around and go through the house, pick up your shoes you left by the door, pick up your backpack, put your backpack where you're supposed to be, you know, you, you know, the whole thing. And push back, push back, push back on that. After a while, it gets easier. I can say that. But it never, all parenting never gets easy, easy. So I'm with you. If both you and the spouse are on the same uh, page, that makes things much, much easier. Thank you. Question from Lilas. When I'm doing easy strength, can I work simultaneous on my cardio by running on some days? Or should I just focus on the get stronger part first? Um, actually, Lilas, I think a really good resource for you would be the work of Phil Maffetone. M-A-F-F-E-T-O-N-E. I've had people describe his work as easy running. I thought, eh, that's kind of a good way to say it. Um, one thing I think you need to do if you're going to do the weightlifting and the running is with the running or uh, the cardio of the running is make sure you have a heart rate monitor and you don't let yourself go too high. Um, when you start doing weightlifting plus running at first, you're kind of burning two candles-ish. 
Now, certainly, you're gonna you're gonna compensate for this and get better. But what happens is with the two things is that you, you just want to make sure you have a, a, enough margin of I, want, I was going to say error, but that's not what I mean. Um, you're asking your body to do accommodation uh, uh, for weightlifting and running. Uh, those are two things. The nice thing about easy strength is that you stay inside this this net. Okay, if here's your max. You know, you stay inside here the whole time, so you never threaten anything in your body. You never miss, never miss a lift. And if you decide to do uh, Maffey Tone's number, so it would be 180 minus your age would be the top rate for your heart rate. So I'm just guessing, top, say you're 40, so you never get to 140 you're running. Well, you can play in this zone a long time, or you can do even what uh, Dardic recommended, which is uh, something I try to do. So I use the 180 minus age and the 160 minus age as the numbers. So 140 and 120 is you drive your heart rate up to 140 and then ease off until it gets to 120. Drive it back up and then ease off. You don't drive back up to 160, just to the 140. And that allows a little bit of a gentle undulation uh, playing, with your, uh, playing with your heart rate a little bit. Um, because, you know, steady state has its value. But most people find that working the heart rate up and down a little bit is probably a little better. Mm -hmm. I didn't say interval training in the in the traditional sense of running at 200 meters, you know, <sighs> sweating like a pig, uh, walking and doing it again 20 times. Uh, it's more of a much gentle style. Mm -hmm. At first, you're going to find it very difficult to figure out those numbers. But, you know, I'm here to help. Remember, so easy strength with Maffey Tones 180 minus numbers. All right, I hope that helps. Hey, would you get back to me? If you try that, get back to me and let me know how it goes. Well, there we go. That was episode number 42 of the podcast. And a reminder, anytime you have a question, email me at podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and I'll do my best to answer each and every question. Thank you. <laughs>